Matthew 27, starting at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, They were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. This is a season of Lent where we anticipate Good Friday and Easter and remember all that that means to us. So we're looking at Jesus' words from the cross. These are not his final words because he rose again and he lives forever. But these were his words from the cross. And so today it's, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if you think about the worst pain that you've ever experienced, what would that be? You think about the worst it's ever felt for you, what moment comes to mind? There's probably a lot of different moments out there. Some of you have experienced childbirth. I imagine that that's probably pretty high up there. I've uh, talked to some people who've said that rotator cuff surgery is some pretty awful pain also. Um, I've heard that kidney stones can be very painful. In fact, I've heard that that could even be worse than childbirth. I've never had to go through that. Um, I hope I never do, but that uh, sounds that sounds pretty awful. But then there's other kinds of pain too. There's being rejected by someone that you loved and respected. There's failing an important task that you had. There's losing a job that you loved and appreciated. And then there's losing a loved one who you cherished. They say that pain of the heart is worse than pain of the body. The Bible here, when it's talking about the pain and suffering of Jesus, it doesn't say that he cried out during his physical pain. It doesn't say that he cried when he was punched or when he was flogged, or when he was beaten with a staff, or when that crown of thorns was put on his head, or when he was nailed to the cross. It doesn't say he cried out then. Up to this point, so far Jesus' words have been encouraging to others. He didn't even talk about himself at all yet. In Luke, it records him saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then in a little later on, to the other thief on the cross there, it says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So far he hasn't really said much about himself at all. He hasn't complained about his pain, or even talked about it at all. Jesus even records in John when he looks and he sees his mother there and he says to the disciple there, woman, behold your son and son, behold your mother. So Jesus is making sure that his mother is being taken care of after he's gone. So he's only thinking about others. He's not talking about the terrible suffering he must have felt. 
And then it becomes dark at midday. When the sun is highest in the sky, it becomes dark. It says that there was darkness from noon until 3 o'clock. And this is not an eclipse. We had an eclipse near us not that long ago, just last year. And the eclipse only lasts for a little bit. It doesn't get completely dark for three hours. And not only that, it couldn't have been an eclipse because a solar eclipse occurs when there's a new moon and Passover was just the day before, or started the day before, and Passovers occur at full moon. So it was not an eclipse. This was not a normal phenomenon. This was not ordinary darkness that fell. This was, this was a different kind of darkness. It becomes dark, it says. In other words, evil has its moment. God's first act of creation was creating light. And in the Bible, light has a lot of connotations to it, and so does darkness. One of those connotations is that darkness is chaos. Light is order. And when the Son of God is crucified, the whole order of the universe breaks down. In light, you can see what is in front of you. You can understand what's going on. In darkness, you can't see. And we are easily frightened when it's dark. Darkness means scary things and evil people. And evil people doing evil things. So there's different verses in the Bible that talk like this too. First Thessalonians, you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, are drunk at night. Or then Ephesians 6. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and in the heavenly places. This is not just ordinary darkness. This is a special kind of darkness. In other words, he is abandoned. He is abandoned on the cross. There's one psalm that is darker than all of the others. It's Psalm 88. And when you read through it, it pretty well captures this moment of Jesus on the cross. And where most psalms end on a happy note, a happy note of praise, Psalm 88 ends with the word darkness. It says, it ends this way, You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Jesus is abandoned. And this darkness signals his abandonment. So where it says in 1 John 1 verse 5, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. When darkness descends on Christ on the cross, it means that God has abandoned him. An eternal bond and heavenly love has been cut off. We don't understand how deep that bond is between the heavenly Father and the heavenly Son. And that was severed, that was cut. When Jesus spoke these words, it was unusual because normally he calls God Father. Almost always he refers to God as Father. But now he calls him God. There's a different relationship there. There's been a severing, a cutting off of sorts. So we sorrow when human love is broken. 
don't we? How much more when heavenly love is broken? We weep when there is a parting of earthly family. How much more would it hurt as a heavenly family to be parted? In Amos chapter 8, God says, I'm going to cause darkness to come like mourning for an only son. I'm going to just read that for you. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account? The land trembled when Jesus died. And everyone mourn who dwells in it. And all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning. It was the Passover. And all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for an only son. There's a foreshadowing of what is happening here. So, evil forces triumph, and a heavenly bond is severed, and also, in other words, darkness descends. He descended to hell, as we say in the Apostles' Creed. He endured the full weight of God's judgment against sin. The judgment that was to fall on us fell on Him instead. And it wasn't just a partial weight of that judgment, it was the full weight. He endured the full punishment of our sin. When we take communion, it says that Jesus paid the full price for all of our sins. Not some of the price for some of our sins, but the full price for all of our sins. So He descended to hell, where God the Father turns his back on him, and darkness descends. Evil has its day. It's very unusual for crucifixion victims, but Jesus cries out loudly at the end. He doesn't cry out at the beginning like most do. He cries out at the end. When you're crucified and you have nails in your hands, and you're on this cross, and you're just hanging there, you die by suffocation and exhaustion. Because you, in order to breathe, when you're hanging there, you have to lift yourself up in order to breathe. And so after hours and hours, you start to lose the ability to do that. And so after Jesus was on the cross for six hours, trying to lift himself up to breathe for six hours and wearing out, he had already lost a ton of blood by the scourging that he endured, and so he would have been exhausted anyways. And he cries out at the end, right before he dies. That's unusual. Something different happened with him that doesn't happen to normal victims of, of crucifixion. In the New Testament, something I discovered when I was studying this week, when it says Jesus cried out, it's the only time in the New Testament where that word is used. This was a special kind of crying out. This was a shout unlike any other. This was a cry of deepest anguish. At the end, right before he was about to die. This word is only used here. And you notice that when we were reading this, it records those words, not just as a translation, it records them as they were originally spoken. More properly, it's probably pronounced Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. 
His words are recorded as spoken in Aramaic because this was the most horrific cry the world has ever heard. And whoever was there, when they heard that cry, that would have been burned into their memory. Because there was no other cry of anguish that has ever been heard in this world like that one. Because while other crucifixion victims die, Jesus didn't just die, he descended to hell. While we might think that we're going through hell on earth, Jesus actually went through hell on earth. And so he let out a cry that the world will never hear again. And they remembered that so vividly that they recorded those words as he spoke them in the original Aramaic. It would have been unforgettable to hear Jesus scream that out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he descended to hell. This is a quote also. Jesus quotes David in Psalm 22, verse 1, except that David spoke figuratively while Jesus spoke reality. It says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So Jesus didn't die. He became the curse for us. He became sin for us. And He was thoroughly and completely punished for us. There's that poem called Footprints in the Sand. Maybe, maybe you've heard of that before or read that poem. Some of you, I know, even have that hanging on your wall at home. And it talks about how at the, the lowest points of life, he looked and there was only one set of footprints in the sand. And so the, the person cries out, Lord, why in these most difficult, difficult moments did you abandon me to be by myself? And God says, well, those one set of footprints, that's when I carried you through that time. So David... David would have seen one set of footprints. And he would have, like that poem said, Lord, why did you abandon me in my worst time? And God would have answered, well, that was when I carried you. David saw one set of footprints, but Jesus saw none. There were no footprints. Because he was cut off. God the Father turned his head. He descended to hell. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Before Jesus was arrested, he was in Gethsemane. Many of you know the story. And he begs God to have this cup taken from him. And in Gethsemane, this is the moment that Jesus begged to be taken from him. It was not the cross that he begged to be taken from him, it was this moment. I'm going to just read a couple verses of Gethsemane here. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him and being in an agony He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. This was what he was thinking about. This was that moment that he begged to be taken away from him. He didn't cry out when he was scourged, when he was betrayed, when he was abandoned by his friends. He didn't cry out when they drove the nails in his hands. He cries out, when God abandons him. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was worse than all of those things. And that's why he cried out at the end, even when he had no strength left, because that's how agonizing it was. He bore the full wrath of God against sin. The full wrath. Not a little bit. Not most of it. All of it. Believers aren't partially paid for sin. They're not mostly paid for sin. Believers are fully paid for their sins because of this moment. Jesus descended into hell and He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you also notice in these words that His faith didn't waver. He still says, My God. God is still His God. John Calvin said it this way, For even though He suffered beyond measure, He did not cease to call Him His God by whom he cried out that he had been forsaken. So even though he doesn't call God his Father, even though that relationship was broken, he still puts his trust in God. My God, my God. His faith didn't waver. This is an amazing thing. When we're suffering, this is human nature, when we're suffering, our faith starts to bend And it sometimes even threatens to break. Because how can there be a good and loving God when there's this kind of suffering? That starts to not make sense to us anymore. And so our faith bends. And in Jesus, when He experienced the full weight of all anguish, His faith doesn't break. It doesn't break. Even in hell, He still didn't call the angels to save Him. When we're in pain, when we're in the worst of our pain, we will do anything to get out of it. Anything. Even crazy, irrational things. But when we're at the worst... We will do anything to get out of it. And he could have gotten out of it. He had just one word to say. I'm done. Or come, angels. And they would have taken him down. They would have relieved him of his anguish. He would have triumphed over his enemies and proved to everyone who was mocking him that he really was the Son of God. That would have all been his in an instant. And he didn't. He endured that pain. He said in the garden when he was arrested to Peter, put your sword back in its place. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? He endured it for our sake so that His mission would be complete, so that He would pay that full price, so that our sins would be atoned for. He loved us through hell to save us from it. He was forsaken by God so that we never would be. He paid the full penalty for sins so that we would be debt free. And He descended into hell so that we never would see hell. Look at the screen here and let's answer this question together. Why does the Apostles' Creed add, He descended to hell? To assure me in times of personal crisis and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul, especially on the cross, but also earlier, 
has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We got to see that gift of God this morning in baptism, where our sins are washed away, and so our wages are no longer death or hell. Our wages are the glorious riches of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here today thinking that you've been abandoned by God, or maybe it feels that way. Maybe you're in that part where you're looking back and you're seeing one set of footprints in the sand. Maybe you're like David, where you want to say, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you feel abandoned by God, Jesus more than knows how you feel. You will never feel it like he felt it. He knows what you're going through. We have the footprints in the sand where God carries us, but Christ was utterly forsaken so that in our weakest moments, we should see those footprints and know that the Lord carries us and the Lord has not abandoned us. He was abandoned so that we would not be. So if you believe in Jesus this day, and if He is your Lord, then you will never experience hell. Because He went through it for you. Romans 6.23, once again, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 5.24 Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Not into judgment. Passed from death to life already. If you believe in Jesus, you will never see hell. If He is your Lord and Savior, then you will not go what Endure what he endured. If you do not believe, then take warning at how seriously God is just. God is serious about ridding the world of sin and all evil. And he is so serious about it that the Son would voluntarily endure it to be rid of it. For the sake of justice, this is what Christ endured. And for the sake of justice, the Father would allow a perfectly righteous person, not just any righteous person, but His only Son, to suffer for unrighteousness. God is very serious about this. As much as we want evil gone in this world, God wants it gone all the more. And Christ is willing to put Himself through all of that to make it happen. John 3.36 Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. If you believe, you will never see hell. If you do not believe, take warning at the seriousness of God's justice. Because one day, death and evil will be swept away forever. And those who are in evil and remain in evil will be swept away with it. But those who know Christ are no longer evil. Those who know Christ have His righteousness and are in Him and will not be swept away. In God's mercy, He makes a way of escape And in love, Jesus makes himself the way and endures that hell so that we wouldn't have to. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 is what I'm going to close with. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. For those who belong to him, you are not destined for wrath, but he suffered it on our behalf. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together.
Lord, our God and Father, we see that, Lord, you are a just God, and Lord, that you are a loving God, that you would give your only Son, and that, Jesus Christ, you would voluntarily go through that so that we would be saved. So, Lord, help us to believe in the one you have sent, to put our trust in him for our salvation by grace alone, and Lord, to be your people always and to witness to others so that they would not be swept away in that justice that will rid this world of evil. We pray all things in Jesus' name who saves us. Amen.